As you've probably gathered from this course, tax policies can be tricky to sort out, to put it mildly. It takes a lot of time and effort to plot out a strategy that maximizes your savings. And because it's so complex, there are many myths and misconceptions popping around. So let's bust some of those mistaken beliefs. And I brought a friend to help us out. No, 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 no hammer. What, no, no hammer? All right, all right. Next time. The first myth on our list is for the would-be homeowners out there, that you can only use the home buyer's plan once in your life. In fact, the same applicant can use it multiple times under the right circumstances. If you aren't familiar with the program, it allows a first-time home buyer to take out an interest-free loan of up to $35,000 from their RRSP to purchase a property. They'll then have 15 years to repay the loan without penalty. The policy defines a first-time home buyer as anyone who hasn't occupied a home that they or their current partner owned within the past four years. So for example, let's say you owned a home in the past, but sold it six years ago. You moved to another city and have been renting ever since. Well, you're now eligible for the home buyer's plan once again. The second myth we'll tackle concerns tax treatment of employee stock options. Stock options can be a major perk for many employees, but contrary to what you might have heard, they are not tax-free. Under Canada's Income Tax Act, employees who exercise stock options must pay tax on the difference between the price they paid and the market value of the shares. However, there is a silver lining in this policy. Currently, employees can claim a tax deduction of up to 50% on those stock options, provided they meet certain conditions. And there's also currently no dollar limit in place. So, if you're keen to snap up your company's stock options, you may want to consult with a tax advisor to see if you qualify for the rebate. Similarly, any bonuses or rewards you receive from your employer are also subject to tax. Most of those taxable benefits are included in your statement of employment, but you also may want to consult a tax professional if you're unsure. Now, our third misconception is one you certainly don't want to run afoul of for any reason that investment accounts located outside of Canada are not subject to Canadian tax law. Wrong. The Canadian tax system is based on residency. So if you live in Canada, any investment income you earn anywhere in the world must be reported. Let me state that again for the record loud and clear. Hiding investment gains in offshore accounts is illegal. If you are caught doing so, you could face stiff penalties and even criminal tax evasion charges. It's not worth it, so don't even try. Speaking of hiding investments, that brings us to our fourth myth, that you can stash your day trading earnings within a tax-free savings account. Not so fast. The Canada Revenue Agency may deem your day trading a business activity if you're swapping stocks and options at a relatively high frequency. In that case, you'd need to pay income tax on your gains. The CRA can audit taxpayers who actively trade within their TFSA, so buyer beware. It'll weigh several factors, including the frequency of your trades, how long you hold assets, and how many securities you're trading. And if the tax authority does decide you're day trading within your TFSA, you may be subject to higher tax rates on that business income and have your capital gains and losses treated differently. Check out the CRA's website for more details on that. Now on to misconception number five, that you can reduce your individual capital gains tax by using a joint investment account. This is a popular idea among couples who think they can split their investing income down the middle. Unfortunately for them, it doesn't quite work that way. The tax rules for jointly held investments are simple. Each person's capital gains must match their share of the original contribution. For example, let's say there's a husband and wife who share a non-registered investment account. They purchase shares together that they later sell for a profit. He contributes 25% of the funds for the stock purchase while she pitches in the other 75%. Come tax time, the husband should declare 25% of the capital gains realized under his income, and the wife should declare 75%. Joint investments can be split more favorably for tax purposes. You just need to have a little foresight on how to divvy up the costs of the initial purchase. We round out our myth list with a final note on capital gains. No, it is not possible to avoid paying taxes on investments if you reinvest the profits. In fact, this was never the case in Canada, but it is in the United States under certain circumstances. Hastily conducted online searches led some Canadians to mistake this for law here in the Great White North. Another lesson in why it pays to take your time and do your research when it comes to your finances. 
And there you have it, our short list of common tax myths busted. Of course, there are many more misconceptions out there, so speak with a tax advisor if you're ever unsure about where you stand come tax time.